Let us begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Let us begin in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, and ask that he bestow his his light upon us this evening so that we may perceive truth in its brilliance and that we may understand with greater insight the revelation of the Qur'an. Today, inshallah, or this evening, uh, I want to do three things. The first is I want to say some general comments about the Qur'an. The second is I want to do a close reading of Surah Taha. And the third is I want to explore the idea of leadership based on the example of Surah uh, of, uh, of Prophet Musa السلام, in, the sor in the story of, uh, of his life and mission uh, as told in, this, in chapter 20 of the Quran Surah Allah. So let us begin. This is going to be interactive. So I hope you came prepared to uh, engage. As for the general comments about the Qur'an as a text, how many of you in here have read the Qur'an from cover to cover in a language that you understand fluently? English or whatever. Raise your hands high. Okay. The Qur'an as a text has themes. What are the major themes of the Qur'an? What are the major ideas conveyed in the Qur'an? And it's not a trick question. This is a very straightforward question. Patience. All right. Patience. Tawheed. Who said Tawheed? Who else said Tawheed? All right. Tawheed, I would say, is the number one theme. It's the number one theme of the Qur'an. Patience is up there. But Tawheed, the oneness of God, that God is one, and his other attributes, without question, the number one idea conveyed with a focus, with a repetition, with a nuance, parallel to, to nothing else in the Qur'an. That is the number one theme in the Qur'an. God and his attributes, all right, and his singularity. Um, or uniqueness, I should say. Um, what else? Yes? Can I ask you something? You said Tawheed is number one thing is mentioned in the last chapter, there's nothing but the Akhirah, the uh, afterlife. This is the number two theme. In the, in the 30th juz, you mean? Yes. Yes. The number two theme, I would argue, is the Day of Judgment, heaven and hell, accountability. All right? The number two theme. Number three theme, four, five, revolve around what? Al-Ahkam, moral Ahkam meaning what? Sharia. Meaning what? Conduct. Conduct. How you, how you conduct yourself in interacting with each other and vis-a-vis -vis God. So prayer and other things, but also mu'amalat, how you deal with one another. Moral composure. Moral composure, forgiveness, patience. Character. That's where patience comes in. All right? Character. Character. Charity. Charity, justice. Justice and mercy are two of the major aspects that govern how we treat one another, or how we should treat one another, I should say. All right. Um, any other ideas or themes in the Qur'an? I guess included in Sharia is also ibadah, so worship. So we have worship and we have, you know, ibadah and mu'amalat. Forgiveness. Forgiveness, yes. Stories. Stories, excellent. Stories, I would say, are not a theme, but they're a mechanism to convey the theme. So it's more of a, of a style of conveying the idea. But yes, there are a lot of stories of what happened in the past, uh, anecdotes, uh, the, the, the stories enable us to access the themes. Yes? Allah's mercy. Mercy. Allah's mercy. And I'm going to say all of the attributes of Allah is within the first theme. So it's Tawheed and his other attributes is number one. All of his attributes. And the number two theme is the Day of Judgment, Heaven and Hell, etc. Someone in the back had their hand? Uh, also, how to not navigate through life with all the things that we have to deal with. Yes. Laws. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that the how to navigate through life fits into the category of Sharia, 
which is a pathway to God, and yes, it has rules and regulations and 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 uh, <coughs> virtue and uh, morality and ethics. All of that is combined in Sharia in a general. If, if you understand Sharia in a broad sense, yes. All right, and the messengers, so belief in the messengers, so belief in God, that we should believe what it is, what is our aqidah, right? So we believe in one God, but also belief in the prophets, all right? Belief in revelation, belief in scripture, belief in, in the divine inspiration of these human beings who served as role models. Yes? The ajaz, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Style, I would, I would argue. Uh, also in substance. I mean, it's both style and substance. But I wouldn't say it's necessarily a theme. But it, there is this in inimitability is the way that it's generally translated. The word ijaz is oftentimes translated as inimitability, meaning you you, you cannot um, you, you cannot reproduce it, the like thereof. Yes. Well, that's the whole idea. Is that it is an Arabic. It is yes. given First of all, to the Arabs. And yet, repeatedly, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will ask them, you know, it is in your own language, but you cannot duplicate it or come close to it. Yes. So that's over and over and over and over. So the miraculous nature of the Quran is a theme in the Quran. Yes, I would, I would, I would say that that is, that is a theme. Yes. Sharia is seen as laws, regulations. Yes. So Sharia is laws, regulations, how we deal with one another, sir. All right. So I think we we hit upon the major ideas, and there are many others, but we hit upon the major ideas. Just to repeat. <laughs> God and his attributes, number one. Number two, day of judgment. Number three, mercy, justice, compassion, how we deal with one another, prayer, uh, ibadah, charity, you know, how we engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and um, patience, etc. Now, why is number two the number two theme? Number one is clear. Why is the number two theme, i.e., the day of judgment, the final hour, a sa'ah? Why is that the number two theme in the Quran? Why is there so much hellfire and brimstone in the Quran? As the brother pointed out, you were the khatib earlier today as well. Oh, Last minute khatib. I understood you stepped up and saved the day. May Allah bless you. So, uh, why, is, why is there so much hellfire and brimstone in the Quran? I mean, the, the 30th juz is filled with very descriptive details about how horrible hellfire will be and how beautiful and uh, glorious paradise will be. Why is this the second most important idea conveyed in the Quran? Yes? All right, so that we're motivated to conduct ourselves in accordance with the Quran. Imagine this. Imagine you're the Prophet Muhammad, and this is going to come up in the, in the context of the story of Musa. So listen carefully. Imagine you are the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was a human being. We don't worship our Prophet. He was a man. He was a human being. He had his feelings. He had his emotions. He had his strengths. He had his weaknesses. Yes, he has isma, but you know, he's protected from major sin, but he gave it his best effort. He made judgment calls. He made decisions that he made as a human. Everything wasn't provided for him, predetermined by God, and he just was an automaton. No, he gave it his effort, and that's what makes us love him, because he put forward that human effort. We admire him. It's that humanness that, that really makes him so admirable, because he's not God, he's a human being. So, um, imagine you're the prophet, char charged with nothing less than transforming the society in which you live. From a society in which um, people worship false gods and they treated each other sometimes with great generosity of spirit, but also they were mistreat, mistreating one another with regards to you know, how they treated women, slaves, marginalized individuals inside. There's great injustice, great injustice. And you are charged with not only transforming the society's belief, but also their sense of social justice and practice. And you have 23 years to do it. Ready, set, go. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? What is going to make an impact on society to the point where they are going to transform 
their customs, their tradition, what's familiar, what's comfortable. What are you going to do? This is not a rhetorical question, it's an actual question. I want an action plan. Who has one? Warn people to shave them. Okay, so to warn them how? Warn them about the coming of the day of judgment. So here's the thing. As the Quran indicates, if you ask them, who created the, the, the pre-Islamic Arabs, or the Arabs at the time of the Prophet, before, before they had embraced Islam? If you ask them, who created the heavens and the earth? Guess what these pagan Arabs would say? Allah. They believed in God. The problem is they believed in false gods in addition to God. But if you said, who is the creator? Who created the heavens and the earth? God. So they already believe in God. What are you going to tell them? Be aware of what? They believe that when you die, the only thing that lives on after your death from this world is your reputation. And that's why, that's why they were so resistant to his teachings. Because all they cared about was what other people thought. All they cared about was their reputation. Some of the things that they valued as a society, and you could argue that they were an honor-shame society, that they had certain things that they thought were honorable, and certain things that they thought were shameful, and some of those align beautifully with the, the values of Islam. And some of them are diametrically opposed to the values of Islam. The things that align beautifully, the generous treatment of a guest. This is a deeply rooted pre-Islamic Arabian custom and tradition and value that aligns beautifully with Islam. We should be generous to our guests. As the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught his companions, whoever doesn't treat his, his guests with generosity isn't one of us. I mean, that's a pretty harsh statement. All right? That was right in line with the pre-Islamic Arabian culture and tradition. However, who can name for me some things that were common in that day that were diametrically opposed to the teachings and values of Islam? Oneness of God. What's that? Oneness of God. Duh. All right, so the oneness of God, that's on the theological side. What about a practice? Yes. Uh, burying their uh, daughters. Burying a female daughter who's a firstborn alive. It's known as female infanticide. You've all, you're all familiar with it. So, what a horrific practice. They considered it shameful to have a daughter as a firstborn and honorable to have a son as a firstborn. And you can argue from a sociological point of view, as many, many uh, social scientists have argued historically, that in a tribal society, there's a utilitarian, uh, oftentimes a utilitarian uh, uh, explanation for why certain things are valued over others. And in a tribal society where the man contributes to the strength of the tribe and the survival of the tribe, and when he gets married, he brings someone from outside the tribe to increase the, the resources to the tribe and the progeny of the tribe. Whereas if a daughter, you raise her, you feed her, then when she gets married, she leaves. So from a utilitarian point of view, in a tribal sense, in a pre-Islamic mindset, you could argue that the pre-Islamic Arabs had less value for women, as a firstborn at least, because they're ultimately not going to help the tribe in the long run, whereas a male offspring will. And so they considered it, this is not a justification. This is horrific. All right, but you can, you can, you know, sociolog sociologists would, would try and explain why these values might have evolved. That being said, Islam is not a simply utilitarian evolution of society. Islam is a higher notion of morality and ethics. And so the teachings of Islam, as we all know, are diametrically opposed to that of, of pre-Islamic Arabia in that the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught his companions to have three daughters and to raise them well is a ticket to paradise. It's a guarantee of paradise. So, you know, inverting the moral, the, the moral paradigm of that time. So here he is, he comes and he says, this is shameful, why would you do such a thing? And the response of the, of the pre-Islamic Arabs would be, everyone else thinks it's great. Everyone else thinks it's the right thing to do. Everyone else thinks it's honorable. Now, we can sit from this day and age and look back and say, what a ridiculous mindset. 
What a ridiculous mindset. Until we look in the mirror today and we see, and I don't know if any of you saw the film uh, Girl in the River. Do you even know what I'm talking about? It won an Oscar. So I'm in LA. We, we, we pay attention to those things. So I was, at the, I was invited to a dinner with this uh, filmmaker from Pakistan. Uh, and I, Shala, I think is her name. She uh, won a second Oscar for this film. It was her second film, the second year in a row that she won an Oscar. And this film followed the story of a young lady who was married by her father to someone, a young man from another village. And they were Islamically married. They didn't have the walima and the rukhsati and all of that, but they were Islamically married. And the uncle comes and says, you know what, I found someone better from a higher standard or a higher status in society from a different village. And so the uncle convinced the father to try and get the, the girl to marry the other, to, to divorce the first one and marry the second one, because there wasn't consummation. So the girl, she was a young girl, she had been speaking to this young man that she was married to now, for the first time probably ever speaking to a boy, and you know she had developed feelings and she didn't want to switch. So what did she do? She moved in with her husband, against her parents' permission. But she was already Islamically married, and so what did they do? The uncle and the father sweet-talked her, oh, come back, visit with us, etc. She was concerned, she was worried that they might do something. But finally she, she caved in, she went and visited them. What did they do? They took her to, on a trip to the riverbank, where the father and the uncle, I think it was the father, took out a gun, pointed at the face of his daughter, and pulled the trigger. Point blank range. Then put her in a bag, in a sack, tied the sack, and threw her in the river. Because they saw, thought, thought that what she did was shameful. And what they did to regain the honor of their family, whose daughter disobeyed them, they wanted to regain the honor in their, in their community by showing that they don't put up with rebellious daughters, and so they, they did this. Miraculously, the bullet entered the girl's face and came out by her ear. It didn't even enter her brain. She somehow escaped from the tide sack without drowning, found her way to the bank, and made her way right to the police station. The police then came and arrested the father and the uncle. The filmmaker got wind of the story right when the girl came to the police station. She started filming. They go and they interview. The father and the uncle who's in jail, behind bars. And they're both saying, we did the right thing. And the way we know we did the right thing is, everyone tells us that we did the right thing. The reference wasn't to God or the Quran or Islam, and they're all Muslim. The reference was what everyone else said, what we did was the right thing. In fact, since we did this, we've received 50 marriage proposals to the younger daughters of our, of our daughter who, you know, who we, who we shot. Because we're an honorable family now in the eyes of everybody else in our community. So we still have a little bit of jahiliya in us. In us. And by the way, I picked, I'm not picking on Pakistan. I could tell you stories in the Arab world. Uh, I mean, there's the, the story, this came out uh, the, on NPR in 2003, where in Iraq, after the fall of Saddam Hussein, there were a lot of gangs roaming around kidnapping people for ransom, and they did this to a daughter. And they, um, you know, to, to a young lady. They kidnapped her for ransom, the family, the tribe raised the money, and they, they paid her, paid for the ransom, and they brought her back. And what did, uh... Okay. Uh, someone has their car, their lights on. It's a Lexus E703C0. It's black, I think. Yeah. So, so the family paid the ransom. They went and they got the, the daughter back. And the uncle, who was very close to her, uh, went to her and then shot her in the temple in point-blank range, killing her. 
in cold blood. And he was being, he was walking around free in society because there was law, no law and order there. And was uh, being interviewed by this NPO reporter and said, what did you do that for? He said, you know, I, I see my, I was very close to my niece and I see her in my, in, my, in my nightmares. I wake up in a cold sweat. She's asking me, why do you do this? And she, he said, you know, I'm a lawyer by profession. I'm an educated person. And I know that what I did is against my religion. And if I were, if I had the, the chance to do it all over again, I would. This is what he said to the interviewer. If I had to do it all over again, I would. He said, even though what I did is against my religion. And she said, why? Why would you do that? He said, we live in a culture where if a woman gets kidnapped or molested or raped or whatever, that means that we are a family or a tribe of loose morals. And the women of our tribe uh, are, walk around unprotected, unguarded, without the, the mahram. And so it reflects poorly on our tribe. And so if a woman has this happen to her, that must mean that she is rogue or she goes against the morals and values of our tribe. And so we have to punish her. This is why they call it honor killing. So, so we had to demonstrate that we are a tribe of good, of good morals and honorable. And so we performed this, uh, you know, this, this uh, punishment on her. And if we didn't do that, we couldn't, and he said this, we couldn't walk in the streets with our head held high. No one would do business with our tribe. No one would marry into our tribe. We still have some jahiliya in us. As, a, as, a, as an ummah. Because what they're thinking about and what the guy articulated, his paradigm, his moral framework isn't what does God think? It, what does everyone else think? So this was the challenge of the Prophet Muhammad At his time, everyone was so, so focused on what everyone else thinks. So the Qur'an, God gave him not just the miracle of the Qur'an, but knowing the mentality of human beings, emphasizing the Qur'an, that it doesn't matter at all what other people think. God is the decider. God is the judge. God is the one who will determine the fate of your soul. Because when you die, your soul lives on. And there's a heaven and there's a hell. And it's very horrific in hell and beautiful in, in heaven. And you don't even want to be in hell for a moment. So, conduct yourself in a way that's most pleasing to God. He is the moral frame of reference. He is the one who will determine the fate of your soul, and it, and it matters a lot. This is emphasized over and over and over in the Qur'an because it is the foundation that will motivate people to change their behavior, if properly understood. Now, we're 1,400 years later, and we're still acting in ways that are reflecting that we're not thinking through the lens of what does, the, what does Allah Taala want from us? What are the Islamic values that is taught by the Prophet? We're still at the realm of what do other people think? Why is that? Why is that? This is a little bit of a tangent. Why is that? What's the mechanism by which we know what other people think? Anyone? Because we are among them. Because what? It comes to some of somebody else's case, we're gonna duck, I mean, judge other people the same way. And how are we gonna we're gonna think it? Yeah, we are part of the same society. We're going to think it only if we're judging some other, someone else's children? No, we would not hesitate to say it. We're not going to hesitate to say it. It's called what? Riba, gossip, slander, all of these things. Well, social media these days. Social media <coughs> perpetuates it, potentially. It's just, a, it's just a, me, a vehicle or a means by which we can perpetuate this, uh, you know, they call it in sociological terms, reification of mores. All right? This is how we, we reaffirm social values through gossip. Even though the Quran tells us that what you say with your tongues, you consider it trivial. And it is in God's perspective, from God's perspective, an enormity. Now, the word enormity doesn't mean enormous, the word enormity means a great sin. Enormity is a negative big thing. It doesn't just mean big. People sometimes misuse the term. It's, in God's eyes, an enormity, a great sin. You know, we all know it's like eating the flesh of your dead brother. It's emphasized over and over and over again. Yet we take it so trivially, and God even says, you consider it trivial what you utter with your tongues. 
But who will end Allah Azim? And it is with God a great thing. So he, so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was challenged to transform the whole society, knowing that he has to an uphill battle. Everyone is always talking <laughs> and reinforcing these values that some of some of which are completely opposed to to, to the values of Islam. And so the emphasis of the Qur'an, and the beauty of the Qur'an, the eloquence of the Qur'an, and the laser focus of the Qur'an on those themes that are repeated was his biggest tool to help him slowly but surely transform the minds and hearts of the believers. <laughs> and that had a, a gradual effect on society at large. But it took, it took a lot of time. After 13 years of preaching, how many people followed him by the time of the Hijrah? Who knows? 73? Uh, more than 73, but no, there were 73 people at Aqaba. 73 people at the, at the, at the, at the, 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 the Bay'ah, the, the oath of Aqaba. But just a few hundred. There were a few, after 13 years of preaching, and this is the Prophet, only a few hundred people had followed him. So it was a difficult and, and arduous uh, transformation that he was uh, and a difficult mission that he was undertaking. So um, now the the Quran. It's important to note some Western uh, literary critics would look at the Quran. They say this Quran. This is it's incoherent. It's not organized in a way. If you look at the Hebrew Bible, it's you know it goes through the the story of the of humanity of the world starting with Adam the Genesis at the beginning and then it goes through you know the history of the Israelites and it's chronological it makes sense it's a, whereas the Quran is just kind of all over the place it, they, they, they would say, argue it's incoherent so one of the scholars early on American Muslim scholars named Mustan Sabir Dr Mustan Sabir who lives in Ohio he wrote a book rebutting this. Uh, uh, rather superficial criticism of the Qur'an. Uh, and he wrote a book entitled The Coherence of the Qur'an. But one of the things that those, those critics of the Qur'an fail to realize is how we as Muslims engage the text of the Qur'an. It's not a book that we sit and we just read from cover to cover in different thematic chapters. How is it that we engage the Qur'an? We engage the Qur'an by reciting any portion, any few verses in each of our daily prayers. And guess what? If you take any page or two of the Qur'an, any, from anywhere in the Qur'an, you pick up the Qur'an, you, you read two, three, four pages of the Qur'an, guaranteed you're going to hit two, three, four of the major themes of the Qur'an. The oneness of God and His attributes, the Day of Judgment, how to treat one another, be patient, mercy, justice, and compassion, etc., prayer, Ibadah, charity, etc. You're going to hit those three or four themes guaranteed no matter what cross-section of the Qur'an you, you pick. Because the nature of the Qur'an and how we engage with it is it's supposed to remind us as human beings. Alright, so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was given this big mission. He was given the miracle of the Qur'an. It has stories, it has themes. It helps him by emphasizing that God is the decider, shifting the moral paradigm of people from what other people think to what God thinks, the eloquence of the Qur'an, the beauty of the Qur'an, it, it blew away any of their sense of aesthetic. It was just magnificent. Uh, plus his character, so he, he had a lot of things going for him despite the, the uphill battle he had. Now, this is the first thing I wanted to say, was that the Qur'an has themes. The second thing I wanted to say was about the style of the Qur'an. And the third, uh, I'm sorry, the second thing I want to say is about the style of the Qur'an, in Surah Taha, and the third thing I want to talk about, inshallah, in the conclusion is leadership. The leadership that we can extract from the story of Musa, alayhi salam. So with regards to the, the second theme, which is the close reading of Surah Taha, one of the beautiful things is that some of the longer surahs in the Qur'an, they have a preamble. They have a beginning. They have an intro. And in that intro, some of the major themes of the Qur'an are touched upon. Then it gets into the story. And Taha, Surah Taha is not an exception. It's a longer surah, and it begins after <coughs> Taha with a preamble. So, it begins, let's begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Taha. What does Taha mean? 
mystical. It's mystical. Only Allah knows. I love it, Omar. Excellent. All right. So this is a whole other lecture. We're not going to get into it. But the, the shortest answer is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows. Uh, there's uh, in in uh, um, uh, one of the tafsir. Um, I'm trying to remember the the author. One of the major tafsir works. Seventy different opinions he, he recounts of the, the, the possible meanings of alif la mim, taha, yasin, etc. But Allahu Akbar. We're going to skip it for right now, for time's sake. Ma anzalna alayk al Quran li tashqa. We did not bestow the Quran on thee from on high to make thee unhappy. <laughs> This is a little bit of a bummer start to a, a surah, isn't it? We didn't send it down to you to make you unhappy. Implied in that is that this Qur'an might make you unhappy. This revelation might make you unhappy. Talking to the Prophet in the singular second person, single, the, 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 the second person singular. We did not send up the, and some say, oh, Taha, because Taha, and then he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet Muhammad. Yasin, and then the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet Muhammad. So these maybe are nicknames for the Prophet. Um, Allah knows best. But, he says, we did not send the Qur'an upon you to stress you out, to make you overwhelmed, to make you unhappy. Meaning that, this is a pretty weighty text. And you might, it might be burdensome. This is a serious revelation. revelation, And this is emphasized in the Qur'an. لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبَلٍ In another verse. لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مِنْ تَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشَّةِ اللَّهِ If we sent down this Qur'an, this revelation on a mountain, it would, couldn't handle it. It would crumble. It would shake and crumble. It couldn't handle it. Human beings can handle it, for those who are in my khutbah today, because we have free will. We have the intellectual capacity to handle free will. Other species, other inanimate objects, they can't handle it. Human beings have the capacity, a unique capacity to handle the weightiness of the re revelation. So, نُلْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا We are going to send upon you a weighty word, a heavy word. So, yes, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was feeling this, the pressure. He was given a weighty mission. This revelation is no joke. So he was, you know, Allah is reassuring him, speaking to his psychology. This is an intimate conversation between God and his prophet that we are privy to, in which God is speaking not just to his intellect, but to his heart and telling him that he understands that this is difficult. And that wasn't the reason why we sent it down. Yes, it's part and parcel of the nature of the of the revelation, that it is a it is a heavy burden. And going on, he says, "Illa It's only sent as an exhortation to all who stand in awe of God. A revelation from Him who has created the earth and the heavens, the, the high heavens. So immediately going to theme number one. A revelation from the Creator. The Creator of all that is, the heavens and the earth. Ar Rahman, the Merciful, who is firmly established on the throne, the most gracious established on the throne of His Almightiness, as Muhammad Hassan translates it. Lahuma fi samawati wa ma fi ardi wa ma baynahuma wa ma tahta thara. Unto him belongs all that is in the heavens and all that is on earth, as well as all that is in, that is between them and all that is beneath the earth or the sod. So, further clarifying and focusing and refining this number one theme, which is a, it's all about God. It's all about God ultimately. Furthering and further further emphasizing God's power, His might, His attributes. And I'm going to skip to the English for time's sake now. And if thou sayest anything aloud, he hears it, since behold, he knows even the secret thoughts of man as well as all that is yet more hidden within him. Now he gets to the most succinct articulation of God and his oneness of Tawheed. Allah. La ilaha illahu. Lahu al-asma' al-husna. 
God, there is no deity except for him. His alone are the attributes of perfection. Now, that was the preamble. Now we get into the story. How does the story begin? It begins with a question. Has the story of Moses come to you? Now, this is the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in Arabia receiving revelation that he's going to then tell his, his followers and his society. And this is a real question. Did they know the story of Moses? Did they? How many say yes? How many say no? How many didn't raise their hands? All right. How many didn't raise their hands when I said they didn't raise their hands? <laughs> yes, they knew the story of Musa. They knew all the biblical characters. There were Jewish tri Arab tribes. There were Christian Arab tribes. They traveled around. They knew the history of their own ancestry going back to Abraham. They, they were keenly aware of all of these stories. Why is the Quran repeating these stories? Because stories are a method or an approach that helps us absorb the, the moral of the story. And the Quran is laser focused on the moral of the story. Has anyone read the Bible? All right, one person in this room has read the Bible. All right. Chapter 12 in the Quran is what's, which surah? Who knows? Not Maryam? Yusuf. Yes. So with Yusuf, the chapter on Joseph. The story of Joseph was also told in the Hebrew Bible. <coughs> I challenge you to read the story in the Bible and then the story in the Quran. Very different styles. The Quran is laser focused on those morals and those themes that I talked about. The biblical story is different in its style. The Quran is very focused on those things and it repeats them over and over. Because of what I said, We're, we engage with the Quran to be reminded and to be inspired. And stories help us absorb and understand. And the, we need the repetition, we are insane, we are forgetful. All right. So, so they already know the story of Moses, but God is retelling the story of Moses with a laser focus on the principle or the morals of the story. So in he, when he's telling the story here, you can imagine different places to begin. One of them would be at the beginning. But if you're not going to start at the beginning, and we all know the story, where in the story would, would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose to begin here? And you're disqualified if you have Surah Taha memorized. In a mountain. All right. Yes. You begin the story at the watershed moment in his life. He's at a watershed moment. He's at a moment in his life of making an ultimate decision. Up until this point, and this point is obviously when he received revelation at the, at the Mount Sinai, or Jabal al-Tur. And, and what's interesting is, he was miraculously saved at birth, put into the, the basket, into the, the tabut, into the, the Nile River, saved by the family or the wife of the Pharaoh, raised by them, reunited with his mother who was able to nurse him, uh, and, his, and, and his sister helped and played a role in that. And then he grew up in the house of this tyrant. And when he became mature, he noticed probably that there, there was an injustice there. He, he had a conscience and a morality. Some of this detail is left out in the Quran. But it got to the point where he couldn't just sit idle by and watch this injustice take place. He intervened. We all know the story. One punch to defend the guy who who was being beaten up by the henchmen of the pharaoh, one punch killed him. Maybe he didn't mean to go that far, but he did. And then he knew he was in trouble. The most powerful person on the planet at that time was after him. So he fled. He fled to escape and to, to be free. And when he did that, he encountered two young ladies who were facing another injustice. They couldn't find, they couldn't get water for their flocks. So he was very chivalrous and proper, and he intervened and helped them get water for their flocks because the men there weren't allowing them to do that. And so, you know, a little, a little bit of a, a Quranic and halal love story unfolds, right? So they, they were very, 
grateful and they said, well, we would like to introduce you to our father, very proper, that was the right thing to do. And so they introduced him to the, they, he agreed, they went to the, meet the father, the father said, you know, basically, I like you, you can marry one of my daughters. And all you have to do is work for me for seven years, and just for good measure, if you want to, if you're a good guy, three more on top of it. So what does he do? He agrees, he marries one of the daughters, and he's that kind of a guy, he does the three more years on top of it. Then he sets out on his own. He sets out on his own. He probably at that time, and it's not mentioned in the Quran, probably at that time had children, had his own flock, was out as an entrepreneur. He's pursuing in the Sinai Desert the American dream, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? He's trying to establish his own business and, you know, probably looking for uh, where the rains fell, maybe there's some, some place to graze or a watering hole or a trading route or something. He's not experienced in that, so he's, he's out with his family and his tribe or his, you know, growing entity and enterprise. And he's, behold, he sees over yonder a light, a fire. He says to his family, Umkuthu, wait here. Right? Right? Lo, he saw a fire in the desert. This is where the story begins. Because it's the, it's the, it's, up until this point, he was, you know, he was making choices. But his choices were, you know, and he was standing up, but it was, it was for himself and, and for, you know, those who he was encountering. But at this point in his life, he's being called, he's looking for directions. But God then calls him to the ultimate direction, to the ultimate purpose. Beyond just providing for his family, he's given a higher calling. And this is a watershed moment in his life. So he says to his family, wait here, behold, I perceive fire far away, perhaps I can bring you a brand therefrom. So in other words, you know, making fire from nothing is, we take it for granted with, you know, a lighter or matches or something. But back then it was hard to start fire, so he said, I'll borrow some fire so we can have some warmth. Or maybe I'll get directions. I'll get some guidance as to where we can go. And he was looking for mundane guidance and he got the ultimate guidance. It wasn't just about providing for his family, it was about transforming the world, establishing justice, freeing a people who were enslaved, standing up to tyranny. He was called to a higher purpose. And remember, he was just, he's a man, he's a human being. This is his moment in which he's, he's elevated in his mission. So when he approached it, and it's, imagine you're Musa now. So imagine you're the Prophet Muhammad, and you're hearing the story of the Prophet Musa, and, he, and you're the Prophet imagining that you're Prophet Musa. So it's kind of a dream within a dream. Just follow me here. So imagine you're, you're, you're receiving this revelation, this narrative told by God with this perspective. Now we're, we're perceiving things as Musa must have perceived them. Whenever, and when he came close to it, a voice called out. O Moses, inni ana rabbuka, verily I am your Lord. A booming voice. God speaks directly, miraculously intervening for the first time in human history in this realm to a human being. This is a major event. Moses is affectionately known as Kalim Allah, the one to whom God spoke. God says to him, I am your Lord. Verily, O Moses, Verily, I am your Lord. Take off your sandals. <laughs> Verily, I am your Lord. Take off your sandals. What's going on there? Why would God, for the first words, he's saying to human beings, I am your Lord, take off your sandals. Does anyone ever pray with their sandals on? Or their shoes? No. Never? Yeah, I do. Yeah, you can do it. It's, it's allowed. All right. Songs are clean, etc. So why, what's the focus on taking off the shoes? What's going on here? You're in the uh, Tuwa. You're in the, famous, you're in the sacred valley of Tuwa. But what, what, what's going on here? 
Someone help me out. Yes. Sacred space, and you have to humble yourself. Aha! So this is not, I mean, it's, this is not the most important idea. This is to prepare Moses to receive the most important idea. For his own psychology, his own mental preparation, he needs to prepare himself to enter into a sacred conversation with God Almighty. When you would do, we'll do, when you would do, when we do, we'll do, we sometimes think, oh, well, we're cleaning ourselves. But if, if you pass gas, and I, you know, there's no embarrassment in matters of religion, if you pass gas, it has nothing to do with washing your extremities again. But when you're in a sacred space, you don't want to be passing gas, eating onions and garlic and all other things that are distracting from the worship of God. So that's why the sacred space, it creates an ambiance, it creates a mentality, a, a mental state where you're prepared to engage in important conversation and interaction and engagement with God Almighty. So some of these things create that, the environment that is ripe and fertile for fruitful engagement with God Almighty. Psychologically, emotionally. So God is telling him, verily I am your Lord, take off your shoes, you're in a sacred space and you're about to enter into a sacred conversation. So prepare yourself. And he even tells him, he goes the next step and actually tells him, Inni anakhtartuk. Verily I have selected thee. I have chosen you. yuha. So listen up to what's going to be revealed. Prepare yourself. Listen. I'm going to say something important. Take off your shoes. You're in a sacred space. Sacred conversation. I've chosen you. This is special. This is important. Listen to what's going to be said. What do you think is going to be said? I'll give you four guesses. And each one should be correct. What's he going to say? He's prepared. He's primed. Moses is ready now. He's taken off his shoes. God has spoken to him. He's in a sacred space. He's listening up. What's God going to tell him? What's he going to say? You're a prophet. I'm your, I'm your master. I'm your God. All right. God, all right, I am God, I'm your Lord. He kind of already said that, but he's going to emphasize it again. Yes, in the back? Yeah, what's he going to say? All right, no, that's later. That's later. All right, so something to do with Tawheed. I'm going to go, I'm going to venture to say that. We just talked about the major themes of the Quran. Guess what? Guess what's coming? The major themes of the Quran. They're listed right here. Something about the Day of Judgment It's going to be there. Something about how you deal with one another, it's going to be there. So let's listen up. Listen up. Fastimi'ah lima yuha. Inni an Allah. Verily I am God. La ilaha illa ana. There is no deity except for me. Fa'budni. So worship me. Wa atimi salata li dhikri and establish prayer in order to remember me. So, tawheed and ibadah in this first idea. Two themes. <coughs> Next. Inna sa'ata atiyatun. The final hour is coming. Prepare for it. Alright? When is it going to happen? You don't know. I'm going to keep you guessing. So that you're always on edge. And you're always mindful. It can happen anytime. Don't know what's going to be. This is really what God is saying. <coughs> Behold. I ha uh, although I have will to keep it hidden... The last hour is bound to come, so that every human being may be recompensed in accordance with what he strove for in life. Akad uchfiha. I'm gonna. It's. I, I, it's kind of hidden. It's unknown exactly when it's going to happen. So, be prepared. All right. Then he says this, and this is a little bit in English convoluted in Arabic, beautifully eloquent. But in English, it's a little bit hard. So, someone translate the English to English for me. Hence, let not anyone who does not believe in its coming and follows but his own desires divert thee from belief in it, lest thou perish. What's the idea here? I'm going to say it again. Hence, let not anyone who does not believe in its coming and follows but his own, de his, his own desires divert thee from belief in it, lest thou perish. Don't get distracted 
Don't be distracted by anyone. There are people who are going to try and distract you. And if you follow them, you failed. You failed. People are going to try and distract you. If you're believing in the Day of Judgment, that's an uphill battle because everyone else is kind of through gossip, through this, through that, trying to get you to focus on other things, what other people think. Don't be distracted by that. Focus on only what God thinks. Focus on what God says is important and good and true and do that. And what God says is bad and avoid that. Because that's all the only thing that matters. Because if you follow other desires, you're going to be a loser. You're going to fail. So don't let anyone who does not believe or focus on the Day of Judgment distract you from it. Alright. Then he goes, so after saying these really important things, and remember, he's God Almighty. He just said, he knows everything that's more secret and even more hidden, and you didn't even say it, you just thought it, he knows it. Then he asked Moses, what do you got in your right hand there, Moses? Ya Musa, ma'atibka biyaminik. Ya ma'atibka biyaminik, ya Musa. What do you have in your right hand there, Moses? Oh, Moses. Now, God already knows the answer to that. So if you're Moses, and God asks you a question as simple and straightforward as, what are you holding in your right hand? How would you answer that question? How would you answer it? One word. One word. A stick. What does Moses do? Not one word. <coughs> he kind of rambles a little bit, doesn't he? He seems to. What does that indicate? What does he say? He says, oh, it's a staff. It's, you know, I use it to walk and I use it to hit the leaves to make the, 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 we're almost finished? Four minutes. Four minutes, of course. I'm right on track. Part. Let's start after. What's that? Like sure, sure. Okay. We're going to continue after the prayer. Four minutes. Right. But I have four minutes until then. All right. <laughs> so, so he says, I knock down the leaves and then my flock eats from the leaves and then, right? He's explaining to God what a stick is. <laughs> Why is he doing that? Well, he just realized he's in a company of awesomeness, so he wants to continue that. <laughs> so a lot of the Mufasidin say he's trying to prolong the engagement with God because what a special and awesome thing. Possibly, but you just remember, two minutes ago, he was just looking to get some coal or find out where the watering hole was. All of a sudden, he's talking to God Almighty. He's probably a little bit overwhelmed. overwhelmed? He's a human being. He's probably feeling a bit, he's probably not so strategic that soon into the conversation with God Almighty that he's, you know, thinking, oh, this is great, let me prolong it. He's probably just kind of a little bit overwhelmed nervous. and nervous and processing what he's, what he's receiving. But it also, yes, revealing that humanness of it, <laughs> does something else that's really important for the reader, which is explain to us that what he's holding in his hand is a plain, regular, ordinary stick. And that's important for us to know because something is going to happen to that ordinary st stick to make it extraordinary or extraordinary. All right? Miraculous intervention. God is going to intervene and transform the nature of that ordinary stick. So this does, and this is part of the miraculous style of the Quran, where it's speaking at multiple levels at the same time. Now remember, taking a step back, and don't forget this, this surah started out with God speaking intimately to the prophet, don't be overwhelmed. Then what does he do? He tells the story of the prophet Moses who had to face the Pharaoh. Now remember, he has to transform his society. Muhammad, peace be upon him, does. But guess what? Moses before him had a similar circumstance. Why do you think the Quran tells the story of Moses over and over and over, more so than any other pro prophetic figure in history. There's a parallel there that's reassuring to the prophet, that's a clear admonition to the, to the, to the Quraysh and to those who oppose him, and that's a support to the believers. So let us pause here for uh, Aisha, and we'll continue for those who want to afterwards. Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Let's begin again uh, after the Asha prayer. Taqabullahu minni wa minkum. Who remembers where we left off? What do you have in your right hand there, Moses? What is that? It's a stick, right? 
It's an ordinary stick, it's going to be transformed to something extraordinary. So the Qur'an is miraculous in that speaking to different audiences all at the same time. It's speaking to the Prophet, Allah, literally speaking to the Prophet Musa. But he's also indirectly speaking to the Prophet Muhammad. And he's speaking to us in today's age, and he's speaking to the companions of the time of the Prophet, and he's speaking to the uh, enemies of the, of the believers at that time, who were analogized in the story to the Pharaoh, who opposed truth and goodness and met their fate. So the Qur'an is a, is a, is a rich text, it's a, it's a beautiful text, and sometimes when we take, a, take our time and do a close reading of the text, we, we, we start to appreciate some of the nuance and sophistication of the, of the style of the Qur'an. And this is part of the ijaz of the Qur'an, this is part of the inimitability, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an is this literary style. That's one aspect of it. So, uh, Moses answers in that way, uh, describing the stick in some detail, uh, and then God, after he does that, asks him to throw it down. Now, what's going on here? <clears throat> this is going somewhere, right? He didn't say, I am your Lord, there's one, that, you know, there's no God but me, there's a day of judgment. Don't let anyone distract you from that, from the path of doing what's right and what's good. Establish prayer. Give charity. Go to the Pharaoh. He didn't say that. He said all of those first part, the, the first, the, the major themes of the Quran. Then he starts, he changes the focus to the stick. And then coming up soon is going to be the hand. What exactly does that mean? It's unclear, but there's something miraculous that happens to the hand. It glows white. All right? Why? Why the shift to those things? Yes? Comfortable. Comfortable in what sense? How is a, a stick turning into a snake and a hand turning white going to make him comfortable? It is, but how? I think just to see, you know, to experience, you know, when the of God. So it's reassuring yeah. Moses that... God is real, that God is powerful, that God is capable. All right, possibly that's one aspect of reassurance, but how else might it be reassuring to Moses? To show that God is the most powerful, more powerful than Pharaoh. That God is more powerful than Pharaoh, but clearly the creator of all that is is more powerful than Pharaoh. There's not, it's not even a, it's not cl a close call there. I mean, God created Pharaoh. God created the entire universe, all of existence all of nature. God created all of that. So it's not a close call, but what's going, what, how, yes? He be weakness, so he would know that he has some miracle with him. Yes. So it's not so much to demonstrate that God is powerful, but to demonstrate that God's power is going to be helping Moses on the mission that's going to be handed to him shortly. He's going to be called upon to do something major shortly. This is laying the groundwork for the ask. God is going to ask Moses to do something. He didn't need to do that. God is merciful. God is generous. God is compassionate. Look what he's doing. He's helping Moses psychologically wrap his mind around what's about to be asked of him. So he's saying, look at the, your ordinary stick. It's going to miraculously turn into a snake. Into a snake. So he says, throw it down. And then, lo and behold, it becomes a snake, rapidly moving. Then he says, take hold of it and fear not, we shall restore to its former state. And it becomes a stick again. Then he says, now place the hand within thy armpit. That's a Muhammad Asad translation. It will come forth shining white without blemish as another sign of our grace. So it's unclear what exactly is going on there. But what is clear is that's a miracle. That's not a human sleight of hand. That is something truly divine that, it, that, it, that involved divine intervention. And he says that we might make thee aware of some of our greater uh, wonders. Then he makes the ask. Now go to Pharaoh. Go to Pharaoh. Yeah, the most powerful guy on the planet, the one who wants to kill you. Go to him. Yeah, the guy with the big armies and, you know, he's the mean, brutal dictator. Go to him. For verily he has transgressed all bounds of equity. So, so this is the story of Moses 
paralleling the story of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, but also equally emphasizing our role as believers who are carrying the mantle of the Prophet or inheriting the mantle of the Prophet forward, you know, moving forward in establishing justice. Go to those who are establishing um, tyranny, approach them, challenge them, establish justice, overturn the, the system that, that it leads to oppression and marginalization and uh, inequity. So he says, go to Pharaoh. Now, that's a big ask of anybody. And Moses, just two minutes ago, was just looking for directions. He's just stopping, I'm just going to get some directions, honey, hold on. All right, and then all of a sudden, go to Pharaoh. <coughs> what is his reaction? Does he say, yippee, okay. <laughs> what is his reaction? He's a human man. What is his reaction? He didn't say no. He didn't say he can't do it. He might have been thinking it, but he didn't say it. He didn't say no. God just did speak, did speak to him, did remind him of what's truly important and truly <laughs> real, what is the ultimate reality, what is the ultimate destiny. It's God, but for, you know, Almighty himself showed him the miracles that he's empowered him with, and then he asks him, go to Pharaoh. What is his response? What's that? So nervousness, afraid, afraid not, how to do it. not sure how to do it. Pray to God too. So he didn't. He didn't say yes right away. He didn't say no. He didn't say yes right away. The first thing he asked for, he was in shock. The first thing he asked for was for God to help him process the question or the, the mission. He said, oh Allah, let me breathe. Let me breathe. Now sometimes we translate it literally, we get caught up in the detail. He's just asking, he said, let me take a deep, hold on, just let me take a deep breath here. Because what is it when you take a deep breath, what happens? Your whole chest expands, filled, your lungs are filled with air. Now there's expression in Farsi and other languages when you say that you're nervous or you're, you're feeling under pressure, you say that your ribs feel con you're constricted. All right? Then peng should is the Persian expression, which my, my heart feels closed in on. You can't, you can't fully breathe. You have shallow breaths. This is part of our, our physiological response to, to feeling stress. So he says, oh Allah, let me not be so stressed out with this big ask that you just made of me. Let me process it. Let me breathe deeply. Let, my, let me wrap my mind around what you just asked me. So literally he says, Ishraq li sadri. Expand my breath. That doesn't mean anything in English. It means let me breathe. All right, so let's just put that in perspective. He's having a human reaction to this very overwhelming ask that, of, that God made of him. And then he says, and make this seemingly impossible task easy for me. Because he can't even wrap his mind around how he's going to go and achieve that thing. Going and speaking to the Pharaoh without being cut down immediately. How is that even going to happen? He doesn't, he's uncertain. So he says, make this thing that's seemingly impossible, make it, make it possible, make it easy for me. Make it something that I can do. He keeps asking. And these, some of these asks, by the way, are part of the third part of the conversation tonight, which is leadership. Leadership. He's asking for things that will help him be a good leader. He says, And loosen the knot from my tongue. Now, how many of you know about the coal and the lisp? And how many know that story? All right. What is, what's going on here? This, is the coal mentioned here? Is the lisp mentioned here? Yeah. All right, let's not get caught up in the details that aren't even mentioned in the Quran. What is he saying here? What's he asking of God for this one? 
What's he saying? <laughs> you don't know, huh? What's he saying? Help him to be effective. Articulate. Let me be an effective communicator. Let me, he said, he said, let me speak with eloquence so that I can be understood. So the Pharaoh can understand the words that are coming out of his mouth. All right, for those who understand that cultural reference, I'm not going to explain it to the rest. All right. Three people are nodding their heads. All right. So he wants to be understood. It's not just for sounding, you know, wow, that's very fancy the way. No, he said, let me be eloquent so that I can be understood. Let me be an effective communicator. The purpose of communication is to be understood by those listening. So he asked God to, ha to help him in being an effective communicator. He didn't stop there. He asked for more. Waj'ali waziran min ahli. And appoint for me out of my kin kinsfolk, one who will help me be, uh, help me to bear my burden. So he says, give me, a, give me some help. I don't want to do this alone. And like any good sibling, he asked that his sibling be burdened with the same responsibility. He didn't just say, let my brother help me. Listen to the next line. He says, he's after Harun Afi, he says, um, he says, and let him share in this burden. Let him share in this task. And give him a portion of this burden. Good sibling. All right. So, um, so he so he asks for that, and then he 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 makes the case. He tries to plead his case to God. He says, so that perhaps we may abundantly extol thy limitless glory. and remember thee without cease. Innaka kunta bina basira. Verily, thou seest all that is within us. So, he asked for several things. Let's recount. What did he ask for? Yes, meaning? Let me breathe. You guys weren't paying attention. Let me breathe, all right? Let me, let me not be so stressed out. Make the impossible task easy. Help me communicate effectively. And then help from his brother. And help from his brother. All right. Help from, get, have him, give him some help so he's not alone and that they can remember God a lot. All right. So he asked for those things, and then God says, Allah, Qad Utita Su'laka, Ya Musa. You have been granted, God said, you have been granted all that you have asked for. Alright, so, basically without saying yes, it was assumed that he's going to do it. The question is, here's, the, here's what he's, he's asking for to do it effectively. And God grants him those things. Now, um, we all know the story, and, and the story goes on. It's a longer story. I'm going to stop here in terms of our close reading, but I don't want you to stop here. I want you to continue reading the story, but slowly, one ayah at a time, and, and just reflecting as we were here today, asking yourself the question, who's the audience? What's being said? Why is it being said this way? There's some, this is, you know, I know you usually have a woman's halaqa. Uh, I don't know what you did to your ustada today, but, uh, <laughs> but there are some very fascinating themes in this story related to women. Fascinating. For there is a verse coming up shortly where when he, when he, after making this ask, God reminds him of all the blessings that he had given him up to this point. As part of like the inspiration and the motivation to Moses, he's already agreed, but he, God is still inspiring him, even after he's agreed, inspiring him to go forward. He says, remember how we saved you and we reunited you with your mother. All right? So he tells him all of these things, kind of like in Surah Duha. When which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is told, "Alam najidika, alam najidika yatiman fa'awa, wa bishirika baalan fahada, 
He was reminding him, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, of all the blessings that God had given him. Now go forth. Alright, so he tells him, he reminds him of all the blessings he was given throughout his life. Now go forward and share the good news and help other people and do good. So he's telling Moses, go and establish justice and free the Israelites and face the, ty the tyrant. Remember how we saved you from certain death? and reunited you with your mother, and raised you under the protection. So, but in, the, in that part, portion, I just wanted to highlight here, we're not going to get into it now, but something very fascinating is said here about the mother of Musa. Has <laughs> anyone ever heard the word wahi before? Revelation. Revelation. Who receives revelation? Prophet. Well, in this case, and remember when we inspired thy mother with this inspiration, and remember when we sent wahi to the mother of Musa. Something to consider, just reflect upon a little bit. There's something special about the mother of Musa that, the, that Allah SWT in the Qur'an says that she received wahi. All right, so I encourage you to continue on reading the Surah Taha and other surahs as well with the same kind of lens, looking at the major themes, looking at the who the audience is, who are the different, the, the sophistication and the nuance of the style of the Qur'an. It's beautiful. The third part of the, of the talk is to talk about leadership. So looking at this, at the, at so far what we learned of Musa and just generally what we know about leadership from our experiences in life, what would you say are the most important aspects of a good leader? Of a good leader. Alright, communication. You need clear communication. Alright, you have to have clear communication. You need to know what your mission is. Aha! Uh -huh. You have to have clarity of vision of where you're going. Because if you don't have that, you're not leading people anywhere. All right, you're just, you know, going around So, But if you have clarity of vision, and you're able to articulate and communicate that vision, you're on your way. That's not sufficient, yeah? Common, common, connection. Common, common, connection. Connecting with people. With people. You have to have a love for people. You have to be connected to, if you are, if you have clarity of vision, and you can talk about it, and you go there by yourself, you're a pioneer, you're an explorer, you're an adventurer, but you're not a leader because no one's following you. You have to be connected to people. Yes? Compassion. Compassion. And part of connecting with people is to love people. Yes, we're not there yet. We're not at the promised land. We're not, have, we haven't achieved the goal. You don't have disdain for people. What I have to say, as, as, uh, as uh, uh, um, the, the Luqman said to his son, What I have to say, I have to say, Don't, don't turn your cheek up in, or your nose up, as we'd say in English, don't turn up your nose in contempt of people. All right? You should still love people, have compassion for people, be connected to people, and then pull, tug, push, walk with, you know, get people to move closer towards that goal. But it, you have to do it with people, otherwise you're not a leader. Uh, what else? What's that? Someone else said confidence. There's re, the, bo from both sides of the aisle here. Yes. And have conviction. Have have conviction. Firm conviction. Yes. Uh, be a just be a just person. Be a just be a person of good integrity, of good morals. Be worthy of being followed. Have good character. Yes. Yes, and and know how to engage in, uh, uh, other people so that it's not just you. It's not just you. You're not by yourself. Delegate. Seek help from other people. Don't take on too more than you can handle. So you have to be able to uh, have these qualities and characteristics. Anything else? Yeah? Recognize your deficiencies and challenges and address those like how uh, Musa al-Islam addressed them. Is it speech impediment? Yes. 
So recognize your shortcomings and your challenges and uh, try and address them to overcome them. All right, yes. Be humble. Huh? Be humble. Yes, be humble. It's part of good character, integrity, being worthy of being followed. Yes. Bravery. Bravery. Have courage. Part of, part of uh, what's difficult of being a leader is being unpopular. Because if you are simply reflecting the sentiment of your community, you're a spokesperson, maybe you're a cheerleader, but you're not taking your community where they need to go. You're just simply reflecting what the status quo is. A leader might have to be unpopular and therefore exhibit courage to, to take a position that's going to pull, create tension, pull and push and tug to get people to go somewhere where they wouldn't necessarily go without that encouragement. So you have to have courage to be unpopular, but still be connected to people. Don't let that friction or that you know, tension that's created from trying to move people in a certain direction create in your heart a, an animosity, a contempt, a resentment, a negativity towards people. You have to love people. And we learn that from the example of the prophet. He loved people. Even those who were so mean to him, he loved them. He didn't turn with resentment to them. He never gave up on them. So that was one of, our, one of the most important parts of the leader. All right. So to summarize, and we'll do a popcorn slide. Any other characteristics? Confidence in your conviction. Confidence in your conviction, yes. Inspiring. Inspiring. You have to inspire. That's part of the articulation as well. Yes. I'm sorry, say that again? To be clear, yes. Learn to forgive. To be forgiving, yes. Not to hold grudges. All right, so to summarize, I'll say there are five characteristics from what I heard in the five buckets, if you will. The first is you have clarity of vision. You're able to articulate that vision. You're a person of good character where you're worthy of being followed. You have integrity. You have honesty, you have good, good, good uh, character, etc. You love people, you love people, and you can inspire people to move. You can, you can motivate people, delegate people, get people involved to go to be, uh, uh, you know, to help in the mission of moving in that direction where you're where you're headed. So, and and the rest of them, I think, fill fit into those five categories uh, for the most part. All right, so all of that being said, um, we have just a few minutes left. I wanted to, in the last few minutes, share with you uh, a little bit about the Islamic Graduate School that uh, I'm heading up. It's called Bayan Claremont. So I'm, my background is I'm, a, I'm an American kid from Arizona. My mom is Christian, Caucasian American from Oklahoma. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm from Arizona. My, my mom's from Oklahoma. My dad is from Jerusalem. So he's Palestinian and uh, moved to the States here in California, actually, originally in 1956. And uh, met my mom, got married, moved to Arizona where I was born and raised. Now, uh, when I went to college, I asked my dad what I should study in college. He said, son, it doesn't matter what you study, you're Palestinian, you're going to go to business. So he wasn't very helpful. But I was good at math and science, so I started on engineering track. But I looked around and I saw a lot of other... Muslims in engineering at that time, because you know we go into medicine and then engineering, uh, and then business, and if you can't make it, then you go into religion. But um, but that's back home. Over here, it's different. All right. So, but I but I was on a spiritual journey. My mom's Christian background, my dad's Muslim background. I knew you know I knew some, but I didn't feel like it was fulfilling enough, and so I didn't speak Arabic growing up. So I finished my freshman year, but then I applied to it. I got a scholarship to study at the Islamic University of Medina. So I withdrew from school. I went and I studied for a couple of years, learned Arabic, found something very beautiful, and decided, I had my walk about there, what I was gonna do. I wanted to come back, go into academia, and, and go and become a professor, and then teach Islam so that the engineering students could take an elective on Islam while getting their engineering or medical degrees. <laughs> Uh, but also provide an opportunity for the society at large, the American society at large, to learn about Islam in a way that was fair and balanced. No, that's a different, that's a tagline for a different organization, but in a, in a way that is, um, you know, unbiased, and, uh, or at least not hostile to Islam. 
Uh, and so um, I, I transferred to Berkeley. I went to Berkeley here, and then I, I um, went to Texas for my master's degree and came back to UCLA for my doctoral degree. Uh, and I began that in 1999. I graduated Berkeley in 96. So um, I was uh, six years into my PhD program, and I was teaching at UCLA as adjunct and at a law school and at USC, uh, doing Islamic studies, teaching Islamic law. And I was approached by the oldest and largest mosque of, in, in Southern California to serve as the imam. So I was a little bit reluctant because I said I'm going into academia, but they encouraged me. And so um, I gave it a try and I found it very rewarding. And so I served as the imam at the Islamic Center of Southern California for seven years while continuing my academic pursuits. While I was there, I uh, was approached by the president of a 130-year-old Christian seminary. Dr. Jerry Campbell, who came with me, came to me, and he said, you know, I was brought on to this historic, well-respected institution to revitalize it because the number of Christian seminary students is declining, and we want to revitalize it, and I've been working on a vision, and I need your help. I said, great, how can I help? He said, well, we want to reclaim the role of religion to be a force for peacemaking in the world, and we want to do that by desegregating theological education. I said, what does that mean? He said, we want to partner as a Christian seminary with a Muslim seminary, a, Christ, a Jewish seminary, a Buddhist university, graduate level, so that we can have our Christian students learn about Islam and the other major world religions from those per, uh, uh, professors and scholars. And then, on top of that, learn peacemaking skills, conflict resolution, learn how to collaborate and cooperate across the religious divide for the common good. I said, wow, that's a brilliant, brilliant vision. How can I help? He said, this is in 2009, he said, uh, I need you to help me identify an accredited Islamic graduate school for us to partner with. I said, oh, that's easy. There doesn't exist any in the United States, <laughs> let alone here in Southern California to partner with. Uh, this is in 2009. So I said, but we need one. We have over 2,500 mosques in the United States. Only 44% have a full-time imam. 93% of the imams were born, raised, and educated abroad, which might mean that they have authentic knowledge, but also means that they're challenged in presenting that knowledge in a way that's relevant to the youth, inclusive of women, or civically engaged. And our three biggest challenges that we face as an American Muslim community are passing on the faith to our youth, having a message of Islam that is relevant for today's world, and reclaiming our narrative in our own words to society at large through representing our faith and in, 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 in through engagement, civic engagement. So I said, we need one, and I think the Islamic Center where I'm at can help create one uh, for you to partner with, and we can educate and set the bar for what it means to be an American Muslim imam, a youth director, uh, an Islamic school teacher or principal, or uh, a chaplain in uh, a hospital or the university, or um, a prison system or the military. So he said, great, if you do that, we'll help you in three ways. I said, how would you help us? And he said, well, we have this uh, well-established institution. We'll share it with you. We'll share the campus with you. Classroom, office space, and student admission uh, office, student, uh, the uh, student information system, the payroll office, the library, everything. I said, wow. That's very generous of you. He said, we'll also give you the startup funding for the first couple of years. I said, wow, that's very Christian of you. <laughs> and he said, there's more. I said, what more could there be? He said, well, we'll give you accreditation. And I said, well, hold on a second. I'm an academic. I know a little bit about accreditation. You don't give it. WASP gives it. The regional accrediting body gives it. He says, yeah, I know. I'm an off I'm a." Uh, um, one of the officers there, and the commissioners there in the, in the accrediting agency, there's a little known pathway to accreditation called incubation. We can incubate you. And we'll have the, the degree issued in our name, but, you know, say by Anne Claremont, but, you know, in fine print, a division of Claremont School of Theology. But we don't want to tell you who to, who to hire, what to teach. We want you to be authentically you as, as Muslims. Have your own board, have your own faculty, your own programs, etc. So I said, this is, uh, this is too good to be true, so we, and they, but they were doing it for self-interested reasons. So uh, they said, we want to attract more Christian students, and we want to be relevant as a Christian seminary. And this is how, you know, they were 
progressive and liberal Christians. There are different kinds of Christians, as you know. Uh, and so we, 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 we worked out the details. Over the next year and a half, we announced it in 2010, June of 2010. And I know because when, when I, and I live 45 miles away from the school, I had driven out there and was about to go to the press conference. We were going to announce it uh, on uh, June 10th. And my wife gives me a call and she says, I just went into labor. <laughs> and I was just about to walk into the press conference. I said, all right, I'm canceling the press conference. I'm just going to go. She says, no, this is my fourth child. It takes me 12 hours from uh, beginning of labor to, uh, to, to uh, delivering. So go ahead and do your press conference. Take your time. Come home. Her mom was with her. Uh, it'll be fine. So I said, are you sure? And she says, yes. So anyway, she divorced me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so she says, yes, I'm sure. So we went forward. We announced it then. Uh, and then sure enough, 12 hours later, we had a little baby girl. Uh, but um, the first entering class of students of three was in 2011. The next year we had eight students. And then 16, 32. We were almost doubling every year. Uh, or more than doubling in some occasions, and now we have about 80 students. We've graduated five classes of graduates, and you've never even heard of us, all right? Because we're we, we're we're uh, or growing slowly and organically, but now we're ready to uh, announce our existence in a broader with with broader uh, effort. And one of the th I'll just say three things about the school because uh, leadership is part of it. When we were developing the curriculum, we said, what do we want? our imams to be able to do. We said we want them to know the tradition authentically, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, the Islamic history, Arabic language. We want them to uh, understand Islamic law and philosophy and theology. But we also want them to have critical thinking skills where they can apply not just you know following a narrow point of view, but understand the richness and the beauty of the tradition Mainstream but big tent from across the spectrum. And we also, on top of that, want them to have leadership skills. This is why leadership is an important topic. We want them to have leadership skills because we expect more from an imam here than we do from an imam back home, wherever that may be. For an imam here isn't just an imam. An imam here, a good one, is a community organizer, is a counselor to young people, is someone who helps in faith formation, a term that's foreign to us, but it shouldn't be. Because we can't just through osmosis expect our children to, pat, to, to absorb the faith in the society and culture in which we live, because if they did, they wouldn't be Muslim. Because that's not the culture and faith of our society at large. We have to figure out and curate the environment for them to be able to absorb this faith. So, someone who helps in the faith formation of the next generation. Someone who is civic, who's civically engaged and can help rally the resources of our community to represent ourselves in our own words to our neighbors, to the news media, who can do a media interview, who can be active on social media and can be relevant, and who can be involved in, in community organizing, meaning helping young people have a purpose in going out and contributing to the betterment of society. Young people need a sense of purpose. And so an imam, a youth leader, a director should have the, those skill sets on how to do all of those things. So we developed courses such as in, that in addition to all the Islamic studies, and the degree is called Islamic Studies and Leadership. We have a course on preaching in the public presentation, how to, how to speak publicly, how to give a khutbah, how to untie the knot from your tongue and be understood by people. Right? We have an entire course on that. We have a course taught by Dr. Rami Neshashiba, who just got the MacArthur Genius Award in October of last year. Uh, he teaches a course called Community Organizing as Spiritual Practice. We have a course on counseling Muslims, taught by a Yale psychiatrist, Dr. Hamada Hamid. We have a course on Islam in America, not a historical class, but a landscape of what is the predicament of Islam in America and how to navigate issues of power, culture, race, as a community. We have a, a course on civic engagement, on interfaith relations, on intrafaith relations. So we teach leadership skills that we want our leaders to have, our imams, our youth directors, uh, our chaplains, men and women, chaplains, 
who are helping in the faith formation of our young people on college campuses around, across the country. More and more universities. Stanford contacted me, they said, we opened up a, a chaplaincy position, send us one of your, your, your uh, graduates as, a, you know, as an applicant for our position. I said, we just launched the chaplaincy degree last year, they're not ready yet. So, but we're, but we're, there are more and more universities hiring Muslim chaplains, which is crucial, because when you send your children off to college, that's when they can go in different directions. So we, 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 we launched a degree in Islamic studies and education, Islamic studies and leadership, and then for Islamic schools. As the Imam at the Islamic Center, we ran four full-time Islamic schools, over 800 students, and whenever there was an opening for an Islamic studies teacher, I was responsible for interviewing the person. And we would get a scores of applicants, and in all of my years of, of being responsible for interviewing the, the, and filling the positions, only one time did we have a qualified teacher. And this is Southern California, some say there are over 700,000 Muslims there. One time, we had a qualified teacher who had a teaching credential and who had the skill set for teaching Islam and a foundation for teaching Islam. One time. So we said, there's a need. We have over 35,000 Muslim children enrolled in full-time Islamic schools around the country. But no master's degree in Islamic education to educate the teachers, nor an educational leadership track for Muslim principles. So we devised a degree with two tracks. Islamic study, Islamic school teacher training, and Islamic educational leadership. And then lastly is the chaplaincy degree. So uh, we launched, we have all three degrees, and just this uh, last year, just, uh, just uh, under a year ago, we partnered with the family of the boxer Muhammad Ali. They gifted us his name so that we can raise money from the immigrant community to bridge the socioeconomic gap with the African American community to support their leaders to become credentialed and help uplift their communities to a position of excellence. We received 17, or we, we, we've uh, gifted 17 uh, students who've enrolled and been accepted to Bayan with full tuition scholarships in the name of Muhammad Ali this year. Imams from across the country, one of our students just got elected to city, the city council position in Cleveland, Ohio. You might have seen his viral video, Bashir Jones, all right, where he was um, in, in his first speech in the, in the city council chambers, concluded by saying, Takbir, Allahu Akbar, you know, and everyone, he had a lot of his family there and community members that supported him, uh, you know, uh, saying God is great in the Arabic language. And so, you know, we have the daughter of Imam Warthadeen Muhammad. We have an Imam from uh, from Houston, Texas, an Imam from Memphis, Tennessee, an Imam from Las Vegas, an Imam from Atlanta, Georgia, an Imam from Sacramento, an Imam from Fresno. Three women from Oakland who are receiving this Muhammad Ali scholarship. We have a prison chaplain here in Sacramento area. So. Um, we are, um, I'm sharing this information with you tonight, there's information out back. Uh, one of the things that we did, some of you might be asking, well, how does this relate to us? Two things. We designed the program for working professionals around the country to be able to benefit from these, these uh, courses and the degree because we offer it in an executive master's format. In other words, six days intensive in a row, 30 hours of instruction are face-to-face -face on campus. One week. The rest is online. We have two courses in that same week. So five hours in the morning for class A, five hours in the afternoon for class B. You can take two classes in one week face-to-face -face on campus, and the other 15 weeks of the semester is online. Almost all of our students live and work around the country full-time, have families, have communities that they serve but they are enrolled full-time in Bayad because they're able to uh, enroll in this program where it is um, designed for working professionals around the country. That's number one. And it's also not very expensive. It's, it's $21,000 a year uh, for tuition, and you get an accredited master's degree in, in a two-year time, two time span. The second thing, and this is very exciting, because we offer it in this format, we're able to attract the dream team of Muslim faculty from Ivy League schools around the country. We have two Muslim faculty members from Yale. 
We have the Chair of Islamic Studies at Duke, the Chair of Islamic Studies at Georgetown, the Chair of Islamic Studies at Toledo, Ohio, the Chair of Islamic Studies at USC, a professor, Muslim professor here at UC Berkeley, a professor from, from Stanford. We have professors from uh, Wisconsin at the law school. We have uh, professor, uh, chair, uh, uh, tenured professors at Islamic law from Toronto, University of Toronto, which is the Harvard of Canada as they say. Uh, we have uh, you know, people like Ingrid Mattson, Omar Farouk Abdullah, Sherman Jackson, all teaching at BAM. And they're able to do that while having their, their full-time commitments at their respective institutions because they only have to be on campus one week a semester and then the rest is through virtual classroom engagement online. And it's kind of, we've, we've tried it out as an experiment four years ago and it's going beautifully. We've done it uh, ever since. So. What does this mean for you? You can enroll in a course, you can enroll in the degree, even while living and working where you are here in beautiful Pleasanton. But also, we videotape those 30-hour uh, in-person lectures, and we put it on uh, video podcast, in video podcasts, broken up into 15-minute segments, and we put it on a, a website, a learning platform called teachable.com, so it's accessible for all of you. So I have cards outside on the table if you want to have a, a, a course, a 30 hour course with Sherman Jackson on Islam and the black American from slavery to hip hop, or a 30 hour course on the lifetimes and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad from Jonathan Brown at Georgetown. You can enroll in that $10 a month and you have access to the entire archive of footage and it's very mobile friendly, you can listen to it as an audio podcast but it's also a video podcast so you can do that as well. And uh, if you have any more questions about the institution, uh, I would love to uh, take your questions. I think I'm a little bit over time-wise, but you've been very generous in inviting me here to give two talks in one day uh, and to stay extra because I was only planning on coming for one hour, but uh, because of the illness of your teacher, we decided to uh, extend this, this evening's talk and you've been all very gracious and, and hospitable in receiving me. May Allah bless you. Let's ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness for our missteps and our misdeeds for our transgressions against uh, one another, against God, and against our own selves. O oh, Allah, uh, enlighten us and illuminate our hearts and our minds with the beauty of the, of the wisdom of the, of the revelation and of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhara da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen and we conclude with gratitude, all thanks and praise is due to God. Assalamu alaikum.